Hello, today I'm going to show you something quite special, a continuous wave dial pumped solid state Ruby laser. And this laser setup actually is not only special in the context of this channel, but also special in the context of general engineering and science, because there have, to my knowledge, only been a few setups like this, maybe three or four, that have ever been created. So this is a quite a special project. And as special projects usually go, this actually took me quite a long time, about half a year to make. And it actually would not have been possible at all without the generous help of Dr. Walter Luz. So I want to thank him for his help towards this project. And I actually always wanted to make a ruby laser, but you know, a normal post one. But uh, about half a year ago, I stumbled upon a paper by Dr. Walter Luz in which he actually proposed this setup. I think was um, created in 2019 and I was very interested in, in creating a continuous wave ruby laser which is quite a special thing so I got to work immediately. Now before I show you how this setup actually works I want to briefly describe why this setup is actually special. Now the ruby itself actually mostly consists of aluminium oxide and only has a few tenths of a percent maybe half a percent of chromium dotant and the chromium ions are actually the laser active ions which create the laser light. Now the chromium ions within the ruby actually operate on a three level system. And this means that more than 50% of the laser active ions, the chromium ions, have to become excited for the ruby to become an optical amplifier. And this means that ruby actually has a very high lasing threshold. You need a lot of power for the ruby to emit light. Now, as a short footnote, I've actually written a blog post about this laser and the theory of Ruby lasers. So if you want to create a device like this yourself or want to understand deeper what I'm talking about here, you can actually, you can read it. Uh, I've linked it in the description below. Anyway, um, because the Ruby has such a high lasing threshold, you need quite high pumping power. And this challenge is usually circumvented by using flash tubes, which emit very high bursts of energy, light, essentially. And these flash tubes usually operate on xenon gas, look like this. So you've got a glass tube with a cathode and an anode, and you've got some xenon gas in a vacuum in here. And for this to actually work, you need high power, so maybe capacitors which are charged, and some high voltage to actually strike the arc. And you need water cooling because the glass actually might fracture from the high intensity light. So using xenon flash tubes actually is quite an evolved system. You need water cooling, you need high, highly charged capacitors, no capacitors for maybe three or 400 volts, and tens of thousands of volts for striking the arc. So it's you really need to, to know what you're doing for safely making a pulse ruby laser. And this system actually has another drawback. If you look at the emission spectrum of one of these xenon flash tubes, you see that it has a very homogeneous output in the visible spectrum. And for general illumination purposes, this is great because you don't have one wavelength that's you know just more intense. So you have a very homogeneous white light. But if you look at the absorption spectrum of Ruby, you've got um, two di very distinct peaks, one at 540 nanometers, which is green, and one at 405 nanometers, which is a very light blue. Now, what this essentially means is that every wavelength, which is not around these two wavelengths, which is emitted by the xenon flash tube, is not absorbed very well. So the energy that went into creating this special wavelength essentially is wasted. So it would be a lot better to have a light source or a pump source, which emits a very monochromatic light, so only one wavelength, ideally. And this wavelength should ideally be 405 nanometers, because the peak absorption at this uh, wavelength is a lot greater than at 450 or 540 nanometers. And if you look around, you can actually find laser diodes, which emit exactly this wavelength, 405 nanometers. And using these laser diodes, it actually is possible to create continuous wave ruby lasers because the absorption at this wavelength is very, very high. 
a lot higher than the normal white light created by xenon flash tubes. Now is another short side note, it actually is possible to drive Ruby lasers continuous wave using flash lamps or arc lamps rather. Um, but these actually are not xenon flash tubes but mercury vapor arc lamps. And these lamps are actually, you know, arc lamps like the one I've shown you I've showed you. But they are a lot bigger and they need a lot of energy because they need to emit the power that this small thing actually um, only emits in a, in a pulse, continuous wave, so all the time. And this means that you need a lot of power, you need a lot of water cooling, and yeah, it's, it's a very involved system. So ruby lasers that operate in continuous wave using these mercury vapor arc lamps actually have been created quite a long time ago. And actually, continuous wave ruby lasers pumped by 540 nanometer argon ion lasers have been created as well. But uh, these argon ion lasers are very involved systems as well. You need water cooling, and it's a very big energy consuming thing. So, it would be a lot better to have a very small and efficient pumping scheme. Which, I mean, a laser diode is a very, very small element, a very small building element, and it's quite efficient. About 30 or 40 percent of electrical input power gets converted to optical output power, which is very efficient in terms of laser emission. So a laser diode emitting in 405 nanometers actually is perfect for driving a laser like this, or driving rubies. And this is actually what DPSS stands for, it's diode pumped, so the pump light is emitted from a diode, a laser diode. Diode pumped solid state laser. Solid state is because the, the laser medium itself, the ruby crystal, is solid state. So in summary we see that it should be possible to use blue laser diodes to very efficiently pump uh, ruby crystals in order to make uh, continuous wave ruby lasers. So let's see how this is actually done in practice. Okay, here we are. This is the system and it's actually everything is mounted on this optical bench plate here, which I bought from Thor Labs. Now first, this is the pumping system. This is the laser diode, which has got a small a spheric lens on it. And it focuses the laser beam that the laser diode in here emits into the ruby crystal. And I've mounted it on here so that I can actually translate it just a little bit, so I can adjust the focal point um, to be within the crystal. I'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. And it's possible to, you know, divert the laser beam a bit using these screws. And all of the parts you can see here are made homemade on my CNC router and my lathe. And for cooling the laser diode, which is a very critical thing, laser diodes really don't like to be in a warm environment. They need to, need to be cooled quite well. I've got some fins on here and I've got a fan which blows air in this direction as soon as this is turned on. And the power comes from this little box here, which um, you know you can switch on the laser, you can um, adjust the laser output power using this knob, and I've got this amp meter which shows how many amps are flowing through the laser diode. Then we've got the rear mirror in here, which is a flat mirror, and I've actually, I'll show the principle of this uh, in here somewhere I think. And this is actually highly transparent to the laser beam, so highly transparent to 405 nanometers, but very reflective for 693 nanometers, so the ruby wavelength. And this is the ruby crystal itself, and I'll show a close-up of this shortly. The next part is the back mirror of the laser, and this is a concave mirror with a radius of 50 millimeters, which is focused on the um, surface of the back mirror in here. And this is highly reflective for 405 nanometers, so it reflects the pump light very well, focuses back into the laser crystal, so we get higher pump intensity. And it has, I think, about 3 or 4% transmittance for the ruby wavelength. So about 96-97% reflectance for the ruby wavelength and it couples about 
3 or 4 percent out of the uh, Ruby laser. And the last element we've got in here is a filter, a wavelength filter. And this is not strictly necessary for laser operation, but very nice because this mirror actually couples out maybe under a percent of uh, this blue wavelength, but because this laser diode is a very high power, actually a, f a fair amount of um, blue light makes it out of the optical cavity in here. So because we don't want to see any blue in the output beam, just red, this filter actually filters out any blue, but uh, all of the red passes it just fine. So here's a close-up of the ruby crystal itself. It is seated in this little holder here, which very, very gently clamps the ruby crystal in place so it doesn't move around. And this crystal is very small. It's about 3.5 millimeters in diameter and around 4 millimeters in length. So a very small crystal. And if you want to, to make a ruby laser yourself using this design, this is probably going to be the hardest part, finding a crystal of this size. And it can't actually be a lot longer because the laser diode doesn't have enough power to permeate the entire crystal because uh, Ruby has quite a, quite a high absorption for this wavelength, obviously. Okay, so let's switch this thing on. And the first step is to power up the power supply. You can see that the cooling fan starts spinning. And now I will uh, start wearing these laser goggles because I do not want to get blinded, obviously. And now when I switch this on, you can see that, obviously you can see the, the bright, bright blue light and you can see that the amp meter actually shows around 350 milliamps of current through the laser diode. I'm not entirely sure whether you can see, yeah, I think you will be able to see this. I'll get a close up of this uh, shortly. Now, obviously uh, in comparison to the pump light, the uh, emitted light is very dim, but um, you know, the laser diode is actually at its lowest power state and this is just just above the lasing th threshold. So, And I'm not interested in running the laser diode any higher than it needs to be. Okay, so here's another close close-up of the laser beam. And I'm pretty sure that in the camera this is quite... Um, I'm, I'm going to turn down the exposure of the camera a little bit so you can see that it's actually quite red and it actually the the emission wavelength of ruby is around 700 nanometers so it's right at the edge of what actually can be considered red and it's very uh, close to infrared which starts at around 800 nanometers and as you can see the output beam is not split so it is a tm00 mode which is pretty good, but um, I can't say anything more about the beam per se. You can't really tell how much, actually, how much optical power this has. It might be around a few milliwatts, but not more. And I can't really say anything about, you know, anything quantitative around about the the divergence and stuff like that because I don't really have the optical equipment here to measure anything like that, sadly. But Another thing is that the general setup is very, very um, touchy. So if I lean on the table a bit, you can see that it actually does increase and decrease a lot depending on how I lean on the table. And if I just, you know, touch the mirror or the screw, it oh, I actually increased the power there. So you can see it's, it's quite touchy. Um, but if I turn the mirror in a different direction, maybe just a little bit, I just touch it, it's it's gone. I can maybe get it back there by turning the mirror a little bit. There it is, yes. So it's a very touchy system. But that's maybe due to the optics which I manufactured myself using using real like optics from, from Edmunds or Thorlabs that might be a different story. Another very interesting thing is what happens to the ruby as soon as it gets pumped. 
and I've now turned down the exposure of the camera by quite a lot so you can actually see what's going on and this is what I can see pretty much uh, with the laser goggles as well you can see that there's one beam and this is with the ruby laser actually being perfectly fine uh, it adjusted perfectly fine and if I adjust the curved mirror just a little bit you can see the beams actually split and the bottom beam is the one that's uh, from the input so from the laser diode so this is the pump volume within the crystal and this so the moving one is the mode volume and if you want the laser to operate we need to get those both volumes the mode volume and the pump volume to intersect as much as humanly possible and it's a very very touchy system it, it needs to be uh, intersecting very very well so you can actually see that it emits light and this actually is the most critical part about this whole system the the laser diode needs to be focused into the laser, laser crystal so the um, bottom beam is as sharp and narrow as possible it needs to be within the focus of the laser diode and the focus of the rounded mirror the concave mirror needs to be pretty much on the crystal in the crystal and both of these beams need to intersect as much as possible and I've actually described this in a uh, lot in a lot more detail uh, in my blog posts which of course I've linked below so you can uh, read about this a little bit more, more about the theory, what is actually happen happening in here. Okay, so to summarize, we've got a small ruby crystal, which is seated in a hemispherical resonator. So one mirror is flat and one is concave. That is pumped by a, 500, a 405 nanometer diode laser. And the, the diode laser is um, fed current by a constant current power supply, just a usual laser diode driver. And of course we need cooling for the diode laser so it doesn't overheat and we need ways to um, both adjust the focal point of the uh, diode laser so it actually se is seated inside the laser crystal to achieve as high um, of pump intensity as possible and we need to adjust the position of the laser diode so it's it is within the crystal as well and we need to be able to adjust the um, output coupler mirror so it so that the pump volume and the mode volume actually interfere or intersect as much as possible and what we get is a wonderfully beautiful output beam of around 700 nanometer wavelength so a ruby laser which operates continuous wave which is quite unusual isn't it so yeah that's about it thank you so much for watching and if you're interested in builds like this you can go ahead and subscribe to this channel or give this video a like and i'll be sure to make more lasers oh before you go another short footnote as i've told you before i've written a blog post about this laser in particular so if you want to build one or learn more about how it works in, in principle and around about the, the theory of ruby lasers and this laser in, in particular you can give this a try and of course there are different posts on this website uh, about material science and um, lasers of course laser diodes so if you're interested in this general sciencey stuff you can give this website a try all right thank you see you next time bye